Fenton and I'm an aeromodeler and an engineer. Join me on a fascinating journey where I show you some of the techniques used in scale aeromodeling. So here's a useful little trick. Uh, you've probably all seen it before, but just in case you haven't, um, I'll show you again. Um, this is very useful if you're trying to identify where cowl holes are on the cowl. So it's the same sort of technique. You'll, you'll understand why in a minute. And what I need to do is identify where these exhaust holes are going to appear on the cowl. Very diff quite a difficult exercise, you would think, but it isn't actually. It's fairly easy. So you lay a piece of paper across the back that falls across the holes. And then to stop the paper wriggling around during the operation, I'm just going to tape it down. It's just so it doesn't move. It's the only reason. Okay. So that paper can't move. Then all you do is get a pen or a scribe or something. And you mark where the pipes are. In this instance, you might even find that something like a torch when shined up from underneath will highlight where the pipes are. Then we fit, refit the cowl, minus the exhaust, obviously. It's a bit fiddly on mine. You see inside, I've fitted baffles and they very closely follow The outline of the engine and sometimes it can be a bit of a fiddle to get it all past the bits and pieces not usually a big not usually as big a fiddle as this there we go so then make sure it's all the way back to where you want it fully seated and positioned and then all you do you lay your paper back down and now you know where the holes are going to be. Cut half of this off. Now I can fold back one half independently of the other and this half then gives me if I eyeball straight down so there if I make holes in those places the exhaust should fit through without too much problems. Okay, and there you can see what's happened. I've cut the, uh, the hole out um, with respect to that template, which gives me an alignment mark. I had hoped to just make holes to push the cowl on, but actually you can't get it on because the exhaust protrudes too far. So I had to do what actually is on the full size and that is a slot. I didn't want to use a slot because it weakens the cowl but I'll uh, I'll beef up the edge a little bit on the inside 
There's some work to do on the cowl anyway. So I've shortened these very slightly, which was a bit of a shame as well. Now, as I said before, this is a standoff scale. This is just for fun. Um, the exhaust should actually be on this side of the center line. But as it's standoff, and there are so many other errors in it, I think I think we've we've done a pretty good job of the next task is to sort this cowl out. Um, it came in two halves and I joined it with some polyester resin and some tape, but it needs another layer inside there. And uh, there's lots of cracks that need grinding out and then filling with more um, polyester resin and cloth, probably on the inside um, and just generally tidying up. Then we'll start sanding it down, see if we can get it smooth. Uh, and we need to think about an access hatch of some sort to get to the fuel filler and to get to the glow leads, uh, you know, to the glow the ignition stuff, you know, the, <laughs> the glow plug. In fact, just by playing around with the height of the pipe inside the cowl, I actually got them to lie flush without trimming any more off and it fits much better. So I think that's that's the final fit. And it's not touching the cowling anywhere around the edges either. So I think that's as good as we're going to get. So we filled in the, uh, the channel that I gouged with four layers of fiberglass uh, mat. It was uh, 48 grams per square meter with some polyester resin because the, the, the cowl is polyester. So I like to keep the resin types the same. Um, there were a few cracks, so I gouged them out. The big one was here. So I gouged them out and filled them with more polyester resin and uh, and glass cloth, 48 gram glass cloth. There was quite a ridge along here, so that's needed some spot putty. Now what this is, is this is a 3M product, uh, acryl red putty. And a tube of this will last you about 15 million light years. It goes to last forever. And it doesn't seem to go off. That one's probably 10 years old and it hasn't gone off yet. So what you do is you just apply it very thinly because it um, it doesn't really dry if it's thick. And it's a cellulose putty, so all you do is you, you apply it. And then once it's hard, only give it half an hour, it only needs half an hour, as long as you put it on thin. This is 800, wet and dry, used with soapy water. I mean, I'm, I'm teaching you to suck eggs here. I'm assuming you all know all this. But the comments were that you wanted to see the the painting and the prep stage, so here you go. <laughs> I also have a, a sponge. Not sure if you can actually see the water in shot, but I have a little Tupperware curry dish type thing with warm soapy water in it. Now that's showing me that the little mark I, I filled in, which was for a pinhole, actually has highlighted that there is a low spot there, an entire low spot there. So, uh, so we'll keep going. But I do think you're getting the general idea. I'm only using 800 grit. Ideally, I'd use 600, but for the life of me, I can't find any. So uh, I need to order some more in. I guess I've used the last sheet. Um, I've got every other grade you can imagine, but the 600 is missing. The soap I've used is just normal uh, soap that you would use for washing up the dishes. You know, in in the UK, it's something like fairy liquid or something like that. Um, quite a good shot of it into the warm water, and it just makes it soapy. Your uh, sandpaper or wet and dry will will last much much longer with the addition of a bit of soap. Again, sorry for teaching you to suck eggs. Now what's actually happening here, because I've put it on a little bit thicker, that 800 
is actually polishing it. It's getting there slowly, but it's it's cutting through the primer quicker than the quicker than the um, quicker than the filler, the stopper. So I'm going to just switch to 400 briefly, so that it actually cuts through the filler uh, through the stopper. And you'll see the difference. And you should really use a flat pad and never sand with your fingers. <clears throat> but when you get to this stage, where you're really just getting rid of blemishes and marks, it's not it's not so bad. Just don't press very hard. And you can see the area around that is now starting to lose the primer. Now all that was here were pinholes, nothing else. So all I should be left with is lots of little red dots where I filled the pinholes. And that was all. So a big row of red stopper is not right. So I don't know whether you can see that. So we've now got pretty much just pinholes in this area. Which is what we're aiming for. So I'll carry on and sand the rest of it and then we'll regroup and talk about the next bit. So there we have <clears throat> the cowl all nice and smooth, all the dings are sorted out, the pinholes um, and it's been wiped down and washed off. So <clears throat> we are ready to go now with the detailing. It's worth mentioning at this point that you need to use either your three view drawing, which is what you should be if it's a scale model, or you have to refer to photographs as to where to position all these panel lights. As the three view drawings, which I'm going to show you in a second, as the three view drawings are not particularly good and they're certainly not accurate, um, I'm going to rely on photographs to position these lines. This isn't a scale model, this is a sport scale standoff scale so it doesn't really matter too much it's not going to get judged in any competitions so I'm going to position the lines where I think looks looks best okay so this is my setup for setting out panel lines or one of the ways that I can do it now in this instance I'm using a Stanley Cubics um, spirit level uh, level laser level and the cowl whose rear edge according to all the photographs, is perpendicular to the thrust line. So I can use a vertical line to set the top panel line, and I can use a perpendicular to that or a horizontal line to set the cowl ring at the front line. So all I need to do is put a mark where the line is, turn the cowl, and I can get this line all the way around, like so. If I move it back to the horizontal, I could get a line there if I really wanted one, but I'm not too bothered. The line on the full size actually goes through the thrust line and is perpendicular to the back of the cowl. So I know where the thrust line is on this cowl and it's slightly above the center hole. So that's going to be my starting position. Okay, so all I'm going to do now is mark with a pencil onto the cowl where those positions are and then I'll follow that up with some fine line tape. When it comes to marking out the model for rivets and panel lines and stuff like that, I find it very useful to use flexible rulers, such as cheap school rulers. And also I have a 90 degree square that I've cut from uh, Mick Reeves G10, which is fiberglass board. It's very floppy and it means I can uh, place it on top of the surface and it, you know, like this curve here, and I can get a bit of a line on it. Not always useful, but when it's going around a leading edge or something like that, it's uh, quite handy for that. So 
much easier to see this pencil than the previous one. Now, as you can see, this bit is not going to work because it's not flat. If you try and bend a rule around that, it's not, it's not going to follow the line. So what we do in this case is we actually use the chart tape itself to set the line. So let me introduce you to chart tape. This is, uh, it's used, I think, in the, in the drawing industry where they want to add lines to maps and things like that. Uh, uh, not so much these days because nearly everything is digital, but back when you had a map on a wall and you wanted to put, I don't know, borders and lines or whatever on it, then you'd use this. And it's, it's chart pack tape. And it, as you can see, it's very thin. This is 1 64th, which is a common one that we use for most panel lines on up to 1 5th scale models. This is 132, which is probably more uh, common on the bigger models, uh, quarter and one third and, you know, it's fairly big. Uh, I've not really used 132nd, but I have a feeling I might use it on this because these lines, these are not panel lines where one panel is abutting against another or one overlapping another or anything like that. Now, these are quite distinguished because these panels actually come apart. So the joint between them is not really insignificant. So I think I want to make them a little bit stronger. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use 132nd uh, line tape. I've not done it before, so we'll see. Maybe it's too much, maybe it's not, but we'll see. That's what I intend to do. First problem, of course, is finding the end. Which is right there. Okay, I'm going to start with an easy bit because it's um, this weight tape is new to me. If it's a straight line, don't put it down onto the surface until you've got the end set. Because you can get it wave just like it did there. So, do it again. The problem was there's a slight kink in the tape where it's been in storage and it's done it again. You just lay it down so it's nice and straight, and then you tap it. You smooth it down with your finger so none of it is lifted. The problem arises when you run your finger along it like that. If it's got a kink in the tape, it sometimes wanders and moves. But there we have it. That'll do. It's a little bit more tricky with the, the wider tape. Seems to have a will of its own, which uh, this 64th doesn't. Just looking at it though, I think 32nd is the right way to go. I'll do these easy sections first, the straight lines, because I've not done lining for a while and it's just to ease myself back into the process and handling the product.
tempting to run your finger along to straighten it out like that. But every time you do that, you take some of the adhesion off the tape. So try not to do it too often. The trouble is it naturally wants to curl when you let it loose. Okay, that's the easy lines done. Now let's start on the more difficult ones. I'm going to start underneath because if I make a mess and the join uh, will be hidden underneath the model. Whereas on top, it'll be far more obvious. So this you do more with your eye rather than anything else. So you start it where you want to start it, exactly on that pencil line and then you start to curve it around following the pencil line but don't stretch it a little bit ahead of itself so that it's following the pencil line but it's not swaying or swerving If pencil lines don't seem to flow, don't worry about them too much. It's more important to get the tape nice and straight. Well, it's not straight, but looks like it's straight. On this section here I can stretch right to there <clears throat> and because I know it's a straight line and it's fairly flat and I put it down it should be correct. Come around the top and join up with the piece we did before where we started from. And there we have some panel lines on. There's a little bit of a wave there, but actually I'm not going to worry about that. That's not really enough to worry about. Let's make sure these are down nice and firmly and that they look right. The next step is I'm going to get my primer filler can out and I'm going to apply four or five coats only along that line. So what we're going to do is I'm going to use a high build filler primer and this is a product U-Pole again. Now look at how thick this is. That's a good primer filler, nice and thick. Okay, and that's kind of what you need, but you can't spray that. It's just too, too thick. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to transfer some to this jar. I'm going to blow the rubbish around from the lid. I have had this quite some time. You can see how thick the paint is. And there's a few particles in that. Oh, there's lots of particles in there. Now, before I use this in anger on the whole model, which I will be doing, once it's thinned, ready for use, I'll strain it, run it through a filter. Just to get those bits out. They're not very nice. It's just where the product is quite old. I've had it for some time. Right, so there's our 
a line for full percentage. So I'm going to come right up to here to give it 50 50. And that's cellulose thin as I've just added in there. It is so thick. I have some high quality airbrushes, but I don't tend to use solvent paint paint based paint through those airbrushes, through my good airbrushes, because the solvent, in this case cellulose, cellulose thinners, can attack the um, the bushes and the seals, which um, is not good. So my expensive Iwata and the other German airbrush that I have, I don't use um, for, for um, <coughs> solvent based spraying. For this sort of work I have two cheap airbrushes that uh, I got from eBay. One has a 0.5 millimeter needle in it and the other has a 0.8 millimeter needle in it. Otherwise they're the same. And it allows me to spray a thicker paint. And these airbrushes don't really care if they get cellulose on them or cellulose uh, thinners is used for cleaning and stuff. The seals seem to handle it quite, quite well and I don't worry about it too much. So there we have our cellulose idle primer. And you can see it's still quite thick. Let's fire up the airbrush. Sorry about the noisy compressor. So the cowl has had an hour to dry, just to flash off. So all I'm going to do now is take some 800 grit and I'm going to use it dry just to get the dry over spray off and just sand the edges where the tape is. Now this is not behaving the way it does when it's 64th uh, tape. This tape is much thicker, so it doesn't look like it's worked as well because the tape is still prominent rather than the tape and the paint being flush. But we'll persevere, see if it works. If this hasn't worked, then I'll uh, I'll do it again, but this time with 64, which I have used and, and do know what happens. So, um, Really, I just want to get this overspray off really first. The trouble is, you see, if you sand it after you peel the tape off, then you, you take away some of the um, some of the ridge and step that you've made, the groove, the channel, whatever you want to call it. So um, anyway, that should do us. Just taking the edge off it. Usually when you do this, when you sand it, the tape is flush with the paint. So I could either put a lot more paint on, which I don't think, which I wouldn't normally do, or we'll just see what we've got. If there's a sufficient ridge, and it doesn't need to be much, then um, we're probably good to go. Okay, make sure that's in shot. So first piece coming off now. So just get the knife under the tape. And then you fold it back on itself at an angle. I was wondering why it was black in colour. It's not right. I think the tape has, has split. But there we go. That's how it should come off. And that is a lovely ridge. That's uh, that's very nice. So 
so that has worked fine. When you look at that, there's a line there. It's just, just visible. And a little, let it go a bit harder, but uh, that's that's perfect. That's exactly what we want. Now, because it's got a lip on it, which isn't very nice, just need to take some zero zero steel wool and just take the edge off it. Also helping to get rid of some of that overspray, that dry overspray that was right alongside the tape. As you can see you can be quite aggressive with this and it's not damaging the channel, the channel is still there. What's happened is um, because I put quite a lot of paint on there's a ridge that formed along the edge of the tape. And that ridge is what I'm just removing now. But there's still plenty of material there. But I'm not losing the channel. This is zero zero steel wool, which is a very fine steel wool. And you have to look specifically for zero zero. Well that's all we have time for on this video, but join me next week when we look at creating lithographic uh, formed air scoops. There's two, one either side of this cowl, and we'll be affixing those and uh, putting some rivet detail on. That should be uh, fascinating, and I'm sure you can't contain yourself. Anyway, so I hope you've enjoyed the video. Please press subscribe and like, um, and I'll see you next Friday.